So continuing on our theme of different ways of, uh, of measuring uh, functional connectivity in the brain using um, EEG or MEG or um, LFP, this time uh, we're going to talk about um, power correlations. And this is fairly simple. You just take the power time series um, and from different electrodes and correlate them. So that's actually somewhat of a vague statement because there are um, several ways that you can take power time series and, um, and correlate them. I'm going to uh, introduce you to two of these different methods and one of which we'll go into um, in a bit more detail in uh, MATLAB. So here is um, one method, power correlations over time. It's very simple. Here you have your, um, your uh, bandpass filter data, so an oscillatory signal. And here's the power time series, or sometimes called the analytic envelope, that you see writing on top. So here's from, let's say, electrode X, and this would be from electrode Y. Um, and then you take these black um, signals, these power time courses, and then you just correlate them over um, time. So that's fairly um, simple to do. Uh, and of course, you already know uh, exactly how to do these. You already uh, know how to extract the power time series from a signal and so forth. You can notice here that um, the two um, uh, signals don't need to be filtered in exactly the same frequency. So this is around 35 hertz. This is around 60 hertz. Um, and still you can correlate the power time series. So this is already a little bit different from... Um, phase synchronization, which we talked about um, previously, where uh, generally you have to um, filter the, the data from the different signals in exactly the same frequency, um, and you're really looking for synchronization in exactly the same frequency. With power correlations, you have a lot more um, flexibility to, um, to yeah, sort of specify the, the time frequency characteristics that you want. And so, in fact, this is one method of computing cross-frequency couplings, power-power correlations over different frequency bands. Uh, this would be um, one uh, method of cross-frequency coupling. So people have shown that this can be uh, fairly sensitive and seems to be able, in theory, to provide um, unique information beyond what is, uh, what is available in, uh, in phase synchronization data. This is shown in this paper. Here's the PubMed uh, ID reference. So these are simulated data, so of course it looks very nice. Here they show that there's a very strong correlation in the, um, the, in the envelope uh, time series, so the power time series, the black lines here. Whereas there's no correlation if you just uh, um, correlate the, the two signals, the, the bandpass filtered signals. So that's these gray lines here. You can see why it would be a zero correlation because they're at different frequencies. So there, there's like a phase mismatch. Sometimes this one goes up and this, this goes, well, for each time this goes up, then this is already going up and down. So that already would give you basically a zero correlation. And also um, no coherence, no spectral coherence. This is utilizing the phase information. So these are simulated data, of course, but uh, there are other papers in literature that have used um, approaches that are inspired by this basic uh, idea of power -lating, um, correlating power time series over time. <clears throat> um, the second approach that I'll introduce you to, and this we'll spend um, some more time uh, uh, talking about in MATLAB, this is where, um, similar to the previous approach, but you, this is an analysis you would do over trials. Um, so this is really for optimized for task-based uh, data sets. So here, pretend these are the time frequency maps from um, two different electrodes. Let's say this is from FZ and this is from OZ. Um, and these, uh, th these are from just trial one. So actually, I think these are not really from trial one because single trial data typically don't look so clean, but that's okay. Um, so pretend this is from a single trial of data from these two electrodes. And now the idea of, um, of doing these power correlations over, um, over trials is to um, define so time frequency windows from these two um, electrodes. Um, and these two time frequency windows can be defined based on some features of the data, like what I did here. So here's a feature and here's a feature, or they can be based on some a priori 
um, hypothesis, which is, um, I think, what we'll see in uh, MATLAB. So, and then the idea is to average the power data from this entire time window. So all of this, you get one number, and that one number is the power values averaged across all of these pixels here, and you get one number here. So now we have from trial one, we get two numbers, power data from FZ and power data from OZ. Now we go to trial two, and <laughs> remarkably enough, uh, the time frequency plots from trial two look really similar to those of trial one. Um, and then you take, uh, you extract the data from the um, single, from the same uh, time frequency window here and here, and so on and so forth, all the way through however many trials you have in your data. And the result of this procedure is uh, something like this, data to correlate. So now we have two columns of data. This would be from FZ and this would be from OZ. Um, and each, and the numbers here reflect uh, and so each row is a trial, right? So this is trial one, trial two, trial three. And the number here is the average power in this time frequency window of trial one, trial two, and so on. And then you just correlate these. Um, and you see if, uh, well, of course, presumably you have an hypothesis about a significant correlation, which in this case there isn't, but I, I don't even remember where these data come from, but that's okay. Um, it's a good idea, I think, when you do this to use a Spearman correlation um, because uh, time frequency power data are generally non-normally distributed, particularly at the single trial level because you're not going to be doing any kind of um, normalization to account for um, uh, yeah, 1 over F uh, fluctuations <coughs> or features. So it'd be good to use a Spearman correlation so that the um, the results are not going to be um, overly influenced by, uh, by outliers or extreme values. So, and that's basically it. So that's this procedure. Um, what I like about this procedure is um, it gives you a cross-trial measure. You don't have to look at the same um, time frequency window. So here, you know, we're asking the question whether um, early occipital higher frequency activity correlates with uh, later lower frequency um, prefrontal activity. So here we have um, a measure of connectivity that goes over, um, uh, over time, over frequency, and over space. So I think that's, uh, that's very nice. This is a useful method for um, hypothesis-driven um, uh, connectivity measures. That said, it's important to um, keep in mind that uh, these are cross-trial correlations, so um, so we can't really make uh, causal inf uh, inferences from a result like this. What you could say, or the appropriate interpretation of a significant correlation in this case, would be that trials that have more high-frequency occipital power also have more um, low-frequency frontal power. So we're not saying that this high-frequency Act, higher frequency activity is causing this um, lower frequency response. It does happen later in time, um, but th this is not a um, this is not a connectivity method that's really well suited for for um, for causality. Um, but we can say that trials that are associated with this feature are also associated with this feature. So um, it's generally not a good idea to apply a decibel. Um, correction or any other kind of uh, nonlinear normalization um, at the single trial level. This is because uh, these nonlinear normalization methods can be um, sensitive to um, to outliers or to unusually small or large values. Um, so it's a good idea not to compute any normalization or maybe just a linear baseline subtraction. Um, and here I say that you should use the same time frequency windows for all trials and conditions. And by this I mean that once you pick this time frequency window, um, this time frequency window should be exactly the same on every trial. So that's um, useful because it will um, uh, prevent uh, any biases from, from uh, getting in the data and it will um, help keep the, the analysis robust to um, single trial noise. Um, oh yeah, so here's just, you know, uh, a few examples of 
exactly this analysis applied um, in the literature. Here they found that uh, that posterior uh, alpha correlates with frontal theta, um, and these correlations differed according to performance on this um, simple perceptual task. Here's another study with the same analysis method where they showed that um, in typically developing children, there's again this correlation between posterior alpha and frontal theta, um, and this correlation seems to be absent in uh, ADHD children. Okay, uh, let's have a look at um, MATLAB. So uh, let's see, here we load in the data. Here we specify the parameters that we want to correlate. So we're going to correlate um, activity at O1 with activity in FZ. And for O1, the time window is going to be pre-stimulus, so 250 milliseconds before stem onset up to stem onset in the alpha band. And then we're going to correlate that trial by trial with activity in a uh, post-stimulus period, 250 to 500 milliseconds, in the theta band in FZ. So that's these parameters for the correlation analysis. Here we have the parameters for the uh, normal time frequency analysis. So run this. Um, here I'm just converting uh, these parameters into indices. So this is uh, the index of the, of this first channel, O1, the time points, uh, the frequency indices, and so on. Here we set up wavelet convolution. This is nothing new in this um, code here. This is all stuff that we've covered in um, previous, uh, uh, in previous uh, lecturelets. Here's where we run the convolution. Now here we're only doing two channels. Um, because uh, I set up this analysis specifically to compute connectivity between two electrodes. So we only need to run two channels. Um, here we get all the data from these two channels, depending on which, uh, whether we're yeah, in the first or the second element of this loop. Here I wanted to show you um, a MATLAB function called eval. And what this function will do is basically evaluate uh, the code in here. So you can see a lot of this looks really similar to this. The main thing that I've changed is this. So here you see this is like hard-coded to be one or two. And here that number is missing. So it goes Chan and then IDX over here. And then I have uh, the, the Chan number, which is going to be one or two. So this line of code does the same thing as these lines of code. So here's a, a trivia question for you. Um, here we're looping over these two channels. Here we loop over frequencies. <clears throat> and here inside this loop over frequencies, we create uh, the wavelet. So here we're creating the time domain wavelet, <clears throat> taking its Fourier um, spectrum and then normalizing it in the frequency domain. So the question is, do we need to, is it redundant to compute the wavelet here inside this uh, frequency loop? <clears throat> so the answer is kind of yes. Um, so uh, the, all of these wavelets, they need to be recreated for each frequency. So they do need to be inside the frequency loop. <clears throat> but uh, when channel number is one and channel number is two, the wavelets are identical. So it's, it is a little bit redundant to compute the wavelets inside this channel loop. So in theory, you could have another loop that goes over frequencies and have that outside here, um, and then create the wavelets and store the, the Fourier, uh, the, the spectral representation of the wavelets. In this case, I didn't do that because uh, there's only two channels. So if we had a loop over 100 channels, this would really add some computation time, and then I, I think I would make this a separate uh, uh, code up here, a separate loop. But just in this case, because we only have two channels, I thought, well, it's, be it's better to um, make the code a little bit simpler, uh, even though these things will be recreated uh, once. So it doesn't really matter either way, but I think it's always it's good to uh, try to think about these issues all the time. Does this code need to be inside this loop here? These are good things to try and uh, think about. 
So now we run um, the wavelet convolution, and here in this um, matrix TF all, um, this is a um, channel, so we have two channels, by frequencies, by time, by trials matrix. So you can see what really makes this code different from, from typical uh, uh, convolution uh, code is that typically, so here we have this variable AS analytic signal, which is time by trials. Typically what you would do is mean over trials. So you would take the average of trials like this. But here, of course, we need all the single trial data. So that's why we keep that. So before going on and computing the connectivity analysis, it's good to do a bit of a sanity check and look at the data and make sure that um, it seems plausible. So that's what this line of code does. We just make these two um, contour plots. And really, you just want to, to look at this and make sure that when you average over trials, so now here I'm averaging the data over all the trials. This is the raw powers, no normalization or anything. If, if you just saw total junk in these plots, then you certainly shouldn't trust the connectivity results, right? So it's just a bit of a sanity check that the code works. <clears throat> so here now we uh, extract the data for the correlations. And this is like that matrix that I showed in the slide. So it's going to be, um, uh, so it's initialized now, so it's all zeros, but you can see it's two rows for, uh, for two channels and then 99 um, um, columns for 99 trials. So this very long line of code just extracts all the data from that time frequency window. For the two channels, you can look through this more carefully on your own. Here we plot the data and then run the correlation. So here we see uh, literally no correlation. I mean, it almost could not be any less significant than this, right? The correlation coefficient is 0 0.01 and the p-value is 0.9. So that's really uh, no correlation at all. <clears throat> so that's fine. I guess our um, uh, hypothesis cannot be confirmed in these data that pre-stimulus occipital alpha predicts um, uh, post-stimulus uh, frontal theta. But here, you know, uh, before you know, writing up this null result uh, and putting too much trust in this, it's good also to do some checking of the code to make sure that that that, that the code is correct so that uh, you know we didn't make any mistakes in the code that would have given us a null result for example if there was a problem with uh, the extracting the the time points or the frequencies so how do you think we might be able to check this analysis to make sure that it worked well I think we could test this by using exactly the same, uh, by repeating all this um, time frequency channel information. And then we should see a perfect uh, correlation, right? So we change this to FZ and we change this to 250 to 500 milliseconds and then we change this to 4 to 8. So now all these parameters are the same. And now we expect to see a correlation of 1, which we do. So perfect correlation, um, uh, very uh, statistically significant result. But this is a good sanity check because if you did this, the parameters were the same and you didn't see this perfect correlation, then you would know that there was a mistake in your code. And then you would know that this other result um, is not, uh, it, yeah, might not be uh, accurate. So I think that was it. That's it for this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and um, I think there's still going to be a few more lectures on uh, connectivity analyses.